Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, who's back Yay. with us after some time away. I hope you had a good time in Wyoming, Brian. I did. It was lovely. Gorgeous awesome. weather there, actually, I gotta admit. Hey, does Wyoming have a national anthem? Be Not being a nation? No. <laughs> <laughs> How about a state anthem? Uh, that's a great question. Does California have a state anthem? <laughs> I don't think it has an official one, although California Here I Come, I think, ranks up there among the oh, dear. almost strands. <laughs> yeah, I'd believe it. Um, I'd have to look it up. I'm not sure. I bet you're wondering why I brought up national anthems. Wow, why did you bring up national anthems, Emily? Because we're talking this week about the Song of Moses, which kind of serves as a national anthem for the newly exodus people of Israel. You know, there are people who would be absolutely horrified on a theological level at the mere contemplation of such an idea, but let's run with it and see where we go and um, what it might tell us about things we're not expecting just yet. I would like to interject to ask what concept, because I had to shout at something across the house. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not the Song of Moses or the Song of the Sea is in any sense a national anthem, and if so... What might that tell us about national anthems? But uh, I, I anticipate that there are a lot of people with theological training who would say, no, no, you're mixing categories. This is God's historical redemptive display of his glory and really has nothing to do with political entities as such. So what was Israel, if not a national entity, having just been liberated from the national entity of Egypt. Also, though, you have to understand the very unique position that Israel occupies within history, being the only nation with which, with whom God has made a special covenant. Yeah, so it's not like West Virginia. But like... <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Not only because uh, West Virginia is not a country, although <laughs> people from there might disagree. Someday. Uh, someday, man. <laughs> Oh, dear. If Texas doesn't secede, I, I imagine West Virginia might be the first. <laughs> so we have already seen possibly a miniature two takes on what's going on here. Is this a pattern for nations, Israel being a nation, or does her special redemptive historical uh, existence as the one nation with whom God formally covenanted set her apart so far that we shouldn't even stretch for such connections and um, hopefully as we talk about what's actually in the song, some of this may get clearer or not, but it'll be fun trying and seeing. So last time we talked about Israel's identity in terms of the Passover and the passage to the Red Sea. And as Brian just pointed out, this is the beginning of God covenanting with Israel as a nation now. The formal covenant comes at Horeb or Sinai when God gives the Ten Commandments. And uh, are these most... to the same mountain? By the way, I was wondering yeah. about this yesterday. Yeah, they're the same Red mountain, sea. as far as we know. And God's going to give the Ten Commandments, and He's going to establish them as a kingdom of priests, and all of that. It's it's kind of a long, drawn out thing, and that's hardly new in the history of the world. The Bible speaks elsewhere of a nation born in a day, referring to the church. By the way, not Israel. But most nations take a little bit of doing. And so we've looked at Israel's identity, not merely in terms of the covenant with Abraham, but now specifically uh, as a nation where individuals have, have come to God through the blood of the Passover lamb, and God has baptized them in the waters of the Red Sea. And they stop and they celebrate, they sing. And what they're singing about is what just happened. So... In that sense, it is a non-repeatable, uh, unparalleled event. What nation has God ever done this for? Come down in fire and glory, blasted the enemies, opened the sea, brought his people through, making a covenant with him as a kingdom, God being the king, or as a theocratic republic, perhaps. Uh, and the answer is not. This, this, this is absolutely unique. And, and the song tells us some of that. I, I think probably, since not everyone who may be listening may have a Bible in front of them, it might be a good idea to read the Song of Moses. So bear with us, please, if you're listening. It's it's a bit long, which is one of the things we probably should talk about along the way. 
Shouldn't songs that are really important be really short and have one refrain that goes over and over again until you're sick of it? This one doesn't. This is what uh, Exodus, <laughs> Exodus 15 says. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariot and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou settest forth thy wrath, which consumed them stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, and the flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst below with thy wind, and the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee O Lord, among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Thou stretchest out thy right hand, and the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them, and all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. And the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he hath thrown into the sea. Well, I think the first thing that we need to notice is that far from being in any modern sense a national anthem, this is a worship song. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to start. So I would ask each of you... I'm hoping you have the text in front of you or can fake it or have a good memory. Um, <laughs> what stuck out here? What 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 was memorable for you in in this song? The repeated emphases upon the purpose for which God has rescued them. Yes. The redemption of his people, uh, specifically towards the end. I need to look at it right here since I have it open. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, or, O Lord, which your hands have established. Yeah, that, that that's a little bit of foreshadowing there because <laughs> the mountain, Moriah, Zion, it, it it hasn't exactly been something that God has clearly defined at that point, and yet Moses, in writing these words, kind of takes it for granted that there is a mountain that will be God's sanctuary and it will it has to do with his reign. So there's huge hints redemptively about what's what's going on in the, uh, in the future. And, well, and, and that and also yet, makes sense because if all of redemptive history is pointing towards, in some sense, the recapturing of Eden, and Eden right. is a, a mountain sanctuary ah. garden. <laughs> Ooh. Yes. You play the biblical theology card. Excellent. <laughs> I've read Voss. 
I'll finish Foss someday. Uh, <laughs> same, same man. I have. Oh wow, that's rare that I've finished reading a book. Neither of you have. I I can put that on my uh, bingo card for two thousand twenty. You you get you you get Foss. I did appreciate um, all that you said, but I what you haven't come back to is it comes near the end because most of the stuff leading up to that is the war stuff. Uh, God's a man of war, uh, talks about the chariots being cast into the sea, drowning the captains. It's very uh, rich descriptive language. God's wrath consuming them, the blast of his nostrils. And then we see God telling us what the enemy thought, what the Egyptians thought. I will pursue, I will overtake, and so on. My lust shall be satisfied. And then God's simple response uh, and then we we switch the camera switches to look toward Canaan, and we see basically the Philistines, those of Palestina, Edom, Moab, Canaan, shivering in their boots for the great power and the terror that God has unleashed against Egypt. This is the most powerful nation on earth, and God blew them away. And here are these little tribes seeing God's army coming, as you say, to move to the next step in redemptive history. And they're terrified, but there is a lot here about that. And I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians are uncomfortable with a good deal of this. You probably all know the, the praise chorus, and there's nothing wrong with it. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Bom, bom. Um, that's from here. Hmm. And at least in the version of that praise chorus, I learned it then turns immediately to the resurrection, which is a good move. Because this is symbolically a resurrection. Israel was in living death in Egypt, and by crossing through the Red Sea, moving toward the Promised Land, she has come to life. This is this is baptism. This is resurrection, and so um, and of course uh, Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration, talking to Moses and Elijah, spoke of his own exodus that he would accomplish in Jerusalem, his death and resurrection. So, from a biblical theological or systematic theological point of view, that that's really good. But that praise course stops there. It doesn't go on to the full majesty of this whole thing. And very few uh, Christian hymns do. Unless you're an exclusive psalm, psalmist and have sung all of the psalms, you probably haven't sung anything that echoes so much violence, so much blood and killing and, and the horrors of war and all of this. And, and, and perhaps this would be the, the next thing, although Emily, I still haven't heard what you have to say. Um, but somewhere in this here, we do need to talk about singing about such things. Is this a completely Old Testament? Is this something we should have left behind? A lot of people have, apparently. Or is this still a valid New Covenant thing? Anyway, Emily, we've heard from Brian. What, what are your thoughts about yeah. this song? I was just noticing, we just talked about the Passover last week. I'm noticing in verses 16 and 17, I guess mainly 16, till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people mm -hmm. pass over. And I believe it's Deuteronomy. I was just flipping through trying to find it. I believe it's in Deuteronomy that Moses is repeating this phrase over and over. You're about to pass over. You're about to pass over. Mm -hmm. You're about to yeah. pass over. Mm -hmm. um, yes. When the Passover is about the angel of the Lord right. coming through. And now the people are imitating ah, the angel excellent. of the Lord after they've been saved. Identification again, because the angel of the Lord ultimately is Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, what by whatever means he may be working. And so, yes, it shouldn't surprise us that, God, that Israel is God's army, and yet God's army doesn't do anything really here but <laughs> run away. Yeah. There are a lot of instances where the Lord's <laughs> army is the angel of the Lord who the comes Lord. down to cut off the enemy. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. <laughs> in, in general, um, and, and here's a broad biblical theological concept, we writers today are fond of talking, right, rightly so, of the battles of Yahweh, the battles of the Lord, uh, and how God at different times in redemptive history has fought evil in different ways. To this point, really, he has rarely, if ever, called upon his people to take up sword or bow and arrow and and face a military enemy. There are a couple of times when they did. You can think of Abraham going after uh, the Mesopotamian kings to retrieve Lot. But you can argue whether or not that was 
more of a personal matter or part of it because Lot's not in the line of the sea. And Jacob makes some some reference to taking some land in Canaan away from um, the Canaanites with, with bow and arrow. We have no, no historical record of what he's talking about, just that he claims he did. But to this point, God's people mostly endure. They have families, they go to their jobs, they raise crops, or more often sheep and cattle. And if there are battles to fight, if there are bows to unleash, they're gods. And so even to this point, here at the crossing of the Red Sea, God's people don't do anything except what um, Moses commanded them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, when this is over, presumably, because when the children of Israel get to Canaan, they're armed, presumably they went along the seacoast and picked up whatever armor and swords and shields and such washed up, because, and, and because shortly hereafter they will fight a battle. They will fight the Amalekites with Joshua as, as their lead. It's interesting, perhaps, that the first time that God's people actually engage militarily in the, in the defense of the covenant line, they're led by someone named Joshua, hmm. Jesus. But uh, that, this is going to change when the children of Israel get to Canaan. God's going to put a sword in their hand for a while. But once they've established themselves in the land, they, they still are permitted to defend themselves, but they're... That's kind of it. Even under the Babylonians, the Persians, they really don't take up swords again until the Maccabean revolt, which doesn't go all that well. And then um, after that, when Jesus comes, he puts the sword of the Spirit in his people's hands. Mm -hmm. So the battle goes through phases. And the, each phase in its time is, is biblical and God-ordained and re truly reveals who God is. God does not evolve and change and wow, I was so into swords, you know, a thousand years ago, but I'm just not into that anymore. We've got this new <laughs> idea going here. Let's play, work with me here. So we do have to uh, take into account that in this point in history, this time in history, God was slaughtering Gentiles in great abundance and causing others to tremble. Now, one thing that we, well, here's the thought, Philistines, Moabites, Canaanites, all of those people got completely wiped out. God had no mercy on any of them, right? <laughs> I remember one Moabitess in particular. Do you? Who would she be? Ruth. And of whom is she the ancestor? Of our Lord Jesus Christ, by Indeed. way of David. The king. Now, how about, how about Canaanites? Do you remember any of them that God had mercy on? Mm, I remember Rahab. <laughs> Wait, whose ancestress is she? The same. <laughs> the same. Same line. Yeah, same line. Now, Philistines, I don't remember any Philistines in Jesus' line, but by the time we get to David, his little sojourn among the Philistines had netted him some really cool Philistine bodyguards <laughs> uh, who travel around with him and who, who helped him fight the battles of the Lord. There's so, an Edomite and, and, as well. Who Obed Edom? Edom? Oh, Yes. Obed-Edom, I think it's a Philistine. I think he's a Gittite. Oh, okay. Because he is the one, speaking of Philistines, he is the one at who they, whose house they park the ark. And when his house is blessed, David signals to, to recollect the ark. But then all of a sudden, this guy named Obed-Edom shows up among the Levitical uh, genealogies. Mm -hmm. It sounds like he got adopted into the family of Levi, even though he had been a Gentile. Because, well, <laughs> we parked the ark at your house and God blessed you. You must be okay with God. I guess you should <laughs> yeah. be okay. Sounds like Peter. Who's willing to forbid baptism if God has given the Holy Spirit to them already? Um, and, and so we look here and it looks like God's not going to have any mercy on any of these Gentiles. But when we look at the, the tribal names more specifically, God had a lot of mercy on a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. And although they trembled, they didn't all die by a long shot. You know, this is uh, the, the whole invasion and conquest of Canaan is something that old and new atheists alike have often condemned. Isn't God being a, a bit wholesale here, complete slaughter, wiping out men, women, and children? Well, That's one, barbaric. Only, <laughs> it's barbaric. We can turn and say, by whose standards are you judging God? But we can also say, and historically, no, that's not exactly what happened. All they had to do was leave. Oh, there is another group, though, that we haven't talked about, the group of uh, Canaanites, they were um, Hittites, actually. Oh, the yes. House of Gibeon? The Gibeonites, yeah. 
They cheated. They came <laughs> yeah. dressed up as ambassadors <laughs> from a long way off. Said, uh, we've heard about you and your God, even in this far off city we live in, and we've come here to make peace with you. Well, how can we do that? You might be neighbors. No, look at, see, these, these clothes were new. They're now they're falling apart. These wine skins had grape juice. Now they're bursting from the alcoholic uh, involvement here. What country uh, did you say you came from? <laughs> oh, one very, very, very far away. Yeah. You've <laughs> never heard of it. We go to yeah. a different yeah. school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yet God, and, and, and here's something, God not only saved these people, I mean, they were committed to, to bondage, or the Josh was vertical. Was, well, then you're going to be servants to the tabernacle forever. And they said, Sounds good, good. Us, boss. That's a good deal. Yeah. Cool. And we so, don't die. Awesome. Yeah. And so, as late as the uh, the restoration, when some of the priests had lost track of their own genealogies, these people, they're called nethonyms by them, still could trace their ancestry all the way back. And, and there's something in this that goes back to uh, to Noah. Uh, when he promised that, um, well, the words to Canaan, a servant of servants shall you be. Mm -hmm. God loving to be marvelously ambiguous. <laughs> does that mean the lowest of servants or does that mean the best of servants? Well, it kind of depends what you do with how you receive it. You submit to it in faith, in which case the descendants of Canaan, these Gibeonites, become they become God's own household servants in his temple, his palace, his tabernacle, while his others were chased from the land, or if they stayed and fought, died. But it's God's land. He's the sovereign landholder, and they had plenty of warning. In fact, they got an extra generation, those 40 years, when they, and Rahab's admission is, we knew you were coming. Mm -hmm. We knew your God's terrible. We're ter we're, we were terrified. We stayed here anyway. And, Decided to take on your God, but you know, so. it's like knowing the volcano is about to erupt <laughs> and not moving. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it's like. Probably a lot wasn't, did. Yes, wasn't Brian? the um, the the tribe the Gibeonites? Were they not also the only servants of the tabernacle at one point in the history of the kings to actually remain loyal to Yahweh? Or am I misremembering? <laughs> I I would need. Something more I need, specific. I need that. to look that up. I'll make a note to do that. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I'm, I, that's not enough. I, I need more information. But you may be. You may well be right. You're not asking the right questions. Today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you see here? That's that we should uh, take note of out loud. It says Moses and the children of Israel sang this song. It's spontaneous together composition or planned in advance <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going with planned in advance that they I, I don't know if they use photocopiers or what to make sure <laughs> are used a projection screen I don't know how suddenly everybody knew the song it doesn't necessarily mean that that same second they start they burst right. out in the song as one would in a Disney musical but it does seem to be prophecy and, and presumably, therefore, the work of one man. But if you side note, uh, a number of songs in Scripture seem to come to us rather quickly at a crucial moment. But I think in each you can think of the song of Deborah, the song of uh, Hannah and of Mary. But I think if you look at each circumstance, there, there, it's a safe assumption that these people have been meditating for some time mm -hmm. upon God's previous revelation and how it might apply to what's going on in their lives at that point. Mary obviously had been studying the Song of Hannah. Mm -hmm. Hannah had probably been meditating for a long time. I mean, how long had she gone without having a son or any children? Deborah was looking forward to battle coming, probably fragments of scripture floating around. But then once it came together, I mean, God used their poetic gifts they were able to create these things pretty quickly. The real question is not so much how did they write them so quickly as how did everybody learn them so quickly. Mm -hmm. But in a culture, society, where oral transmission is the order of the day, and you don't have handouts, and you don't have production screens, and you can't all look it up on your phones, <laughs> uh, it, it's much easier to, to transmit. People are used to it. And I suspect that's what's happening here. Miriam and the women, it, it so worked out that Miriam and the women come in and we're told, uh, where is it? Miriam answered them, where them is masculine. So the men are carrying 
the the main line and the women are coming in with the uh, tambourines, timbrels, percussion, and supplying the antiphonal chorus. So the, the, this is this is a carefully thought out. Now, could God do this by miracle? Yes, obviously he could have. But, but he I get me to my he, own reference to the antiphonal quality here. I am <laughs> a little mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and there is a chorus. Yay! Choruses are okay. I will mm -hmm. sing unto the Lord for, or you sing unto the Lord. Sing ye to the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he thrown into the sea. So that's something. The uh, the psalm the 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 prefer of psalms in me says um, note the length. It's 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 not in stanzas. It's not if if it was sung, it was sung through. It wasn't apparently repetitive stanzas where you have the same tune that you just keep singing over and over again, although I don't know enough about Hebrew to know if that would be possible to break it down that way. Uh, but it, it's a long song, and it's a worship song. It's a long worship song, but it includes a chorus and, and musical instruments and parts. Wow, that's cool. We don't do that much anymore. Those of us who sing long songs may not have any instrument besides an organ or piano, Timbrels, tambourines, would be probably right out, as would any kind of dancing. <laughs> On the other hand, those who who are fond of parts and, and musical instruments generally do choruses and shorter songs. And then that brings us back to to something that, that Brian's already um, kind of touched on. The, uh, the theme of the song is what God's doing. Mm -hmm. The word I only appears a few times. I and my. The, the singer says, I will sing to the Lord. He's become my strength, my song. I will prepare an habitation. But after that, it's mostly all about God has done this, God has done that, his enemies did this, God responded this way, his enemies did that, God responded that way, God's going to do this, God's going to do that. Um, it's about God's great acts in history. It's not particularly about how the singer feels about God, how he's going to dedicate his life to God. Oh, well, there's a touch of that. It, it's overwhelmingly a song of praise to God for his acts in history. But it's done with great beauty and great poetry. And, you know, I'm going to come back to it now with a touch of blood. So what what do you all think about that? Is this a fit song for Christian worship or should this have died out when um, God divorced Israel and took up the church as his bride? Obviously, we need to unhitch this type of... Uh, I'm kidding. Get out of here, Brian. You're no longer welcome here. Marcy, Marcy, I like this comment. Um, no. Uh, my, so this will get a little bit into my own personal views regarding specifically the imprecatory psalms. But mm -hmm. there is absolutely a time and place for the church to sing about and even pray for the destruction of God's enemies. So that's more or less my opinion. Blank. I can say I can say I'm into that, but I sense that you want to. I would that like out. to nuance it. Yeah, go ahead and nuance it. <laughs> and this is this is slightly off topic, so I'll make it quick. When it comes to imprecatory psalms, I don't think that we should start replacing God's enemy with names. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there are people who do that. It's a little <laughs> presumptuous. And. Um, I also think it's a little bit wrong-headed because if we're looking at scripture as pointing towards Christ and mm -hmm. we can see, you know, the wicked garner this punishment from God, this mm -hmm. displeasure, and we realize that that's the same displeasure that Christ underwent on the cross, mm -hmm. and then we put someone's name into the place of the wicked when yes. Christ might have paid that price for them. Right. It's incredibly I I presumptive. It is presumptive. <laughs> and I believe it it might time. even uh run afoul of the third commandment to yeah. not yeah. take the Lord's name in vain. So there's even, my opinion. Even the first commandment, like as you said, Christ was the one who bore the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. So to put someone else's name in there, you're even putting that name in the place of Christ. To an extent, yes. To an extent. Yeah. De yeah. Depending on a sovereign decree whose end we have not yet seen. Right. Yes. So it's it's very 
I don't like doing that. Yeah. So we don't. No, that's but, bad. Uh, no I, I absolutely agree. I think you've made some wonderful points there. And so um, in specific, pointing back to the Song of Moses now, now I'll bring it back to the actual topic we're talking yeah. about. You can you can take a lot of that same wariness on my part about application and say, you know, this is something that God does to the wicked. If if you're not found in Christ, you come under floodwaters of judgment. Yes. And we do ourselves no favors as Christians, as the church, by pretending that God does not bring judgment upon sin. And so to only sing things about the happiness and the uh, the warm and fuzzy feelings we get from uh, the spirit or or from recognizing our, our own savior without acknowledging, hey, that warm, fuzzy feeling comes from being rescued from something horrible. Right. And there are people who will come under that. Yeah. We miss the point of the gospel itself by lack of emphasis on all of its parts. So the Song of Moses um, is, in that sense then, a gospel song. Mm -hmm. It tells us what God does for his people, not only specifically Mm -hmm. the nation of Israel, but all people who are of Israel and grafted into the, the root of Abraham. And what the enemies of the seed and those in the seed will undergo as well. And so it is something that we should not avoid or ignore or downplay. Mm-hmm. Whether that means we sing the song of Moses every week, you know, we don't <laughs> there's that's a, there's probably a lot not of other the things way in scripture we can sing too. It's yeah. the wrong overemphasis now. But um <laughs> it is it is still something to emphasize and to recognize the importance of. Mm-hmm. It's something that is still part of the eternal unchanging character of God that we worship who we worship mm-hmm. now if i can can i tag on the end of that okay then i'll tag it, on the end of what you said okay. <laughs> verse three the lord is a man of war the lord is his name like mm-hmm. i don't remember the last time i heard someone say you know the lord he's a man of war like yeah. you you just don't hear that and you know jesus christ is the same yesterday and today and forever this is a direct statement about God's character. Yeah. And so it, it would be mildly unwise to say the least to, uh, I think, neglect this very clear statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking about the attributes of God, of whom God, who God is in himself. Mm-hmm. And to um, say, but I don't like this God. This God's bloody. This God kills people. And that's the only God there is. So, but this is the same God who killed his son so that we could live. And again, the new atheists aren't happy with that one. Either. Well, your God's barbaric. He sacrifices his son for complete strangers and enemies. What kind of God is that? Praise God, the God who really exists. In line with what you both said, I would like to read now from the book of Revelation, chapter 15. And this follows a particularly bloody section of chapter 14, where the harvesting angels are so successful that the blood of the people they've harvested, in this case the saints, runs up to the height of the of the uh, horses bridles uh, north and south across the land. It's really bloody. And chapter 15 begins, it, it looks at these who, who have been martyred, but he sees them now standing in heaven. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. God has bottled up the blood of the martyrs and turned it into vials to be poured out, vials that contain his wrath. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, Mm. the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest." And then he sees the tabernacle open and seven angels coming out with the vials of the last seven plagues, which they pour out in chapter 16, which is another remarkably bloody section of scripture. 
But in, in the heart of these two bloody sections, we have a reference to the Song of Moses, but it's no longer just the Song of Moses. It's the Song of Moses and of the Lamb. And although it's supposedly the same song, the words are completely different. Mm. But the tone is much the same. It's praising God's works, great and marvelous, just and true are your ways. People are going to fear you and all nations are going to come and worship before you because your judgments are manifest. That's the same thing that, that Moses and the children of Israel sang about. So uh, amen to, to what you both said about the song revealing the attributes of God, being about God, not about us. And and I, I'd like to, to hop back, Brian, to, to what you were saying, because I think it was involved in the point I was making earlier. We look at this and we see Canaanites and Philistines and Moabites. We don't see and Bob and Sam and Fred and Ted and Ned, <laughs> because if we if that were the case, and Ruth, oh wait, she's special. The inclusion of these broad categories does not mean that God doesn't have people here. Mm -hmm. These are God's enemies, but not all of them, not every single person. Some of these are his elect. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wrath that God pours out of the world will either touch the world or it will have been born by Jesus Christ. It's the same wrath. Uh, and I think that was a marvelous point you made, Brian, mm -hmm. that it's not for us to decide who's in Christ for whom this wrath has already been absorbed and who stands outside of him. But it does mean when we pray against God as enemies, we're praying one of two things, either that they may be found in Christ, that they will, they'll be converted, that they will in that sense be slain as Saul was on the road to Damascus and raised again in newness of life, or that God in the end, in his way and time, will temporally and eternally judge them, either repentance or destruction, but the verdict is in God's hands. And it'd be very presumptive. Just as we teach our little children, don't tell people to go to hell, and well, neither <laughs> should we. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. I was uh, on that topic. I was just talking yesterday or the day before with a friend about why a character like the Punisher from mm -hmm. the Marvel comics is so yeah. popular among people. And oh, it's yeah. entirely because they don't have this concept of an eternal and uh, lawgiver and just eternal judge as well. So, you know, somebody fools the courts, you have to have this vigilante person who comes out and enacts blood justice on them. Because yeah. what do you do when the justice system is unjust? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, as Christians, we say we appeal to God to judge. <laughs> yes. Um, we don't become costume vigil vigilantes swinging <laughs> from bat ropes and such. Um, we, they make fun stories, but we don't do that. They, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, th this opens up an entire another line of discussion that we probably should have sometime, but I, I want to just hint at it so it's on record. I, I, I haven't followed Punisher enough, but I know the type of character because both DC and Marvel have their share of them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it goes back at least to Batman and Superman, who were vigil very much vigilantes when they first came out, breaking laws and ignoring all of the uh, the normal civil rights and, and such that people might have. But what we have seen in the late 20th century, now on into the 21st century, certainly, is that these the, the bad guys are really bad until they're not. The moment the bad guy does something really good, like save my best friend or risk his life to save a little girl, you know, the save the cat moment. <laughs> well, now his existential choices at this moment make him a good guy. And now rather than try to bring him to justice, we put him on our team. Yeah. And he becomes one of us now. And we like that he's exempt from the rules because, yeah, we, because need and, him. And we Yeah, and, and he's become our pal. And we may even ourselves help cheat the justice system when they come after him. Mm -hmm. Because no, but he's done so much good and if anybody's <laughs> watched blacklist here's one <laughs> raymond redding thing comes to mind uh and 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 there's much in 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 not only comics but in hollywood that's that's follow this line of making us sorry for the evil doer because he's decided to do some good things now and somehow because he is what he is at the moment by his existential choices the past no longer matters mm. Uh, maybe he owes some restitution, some money, or so, I'm, I'm sorry to somebody someplace. But fundamentally, he's a different person now because of the choices he's make. You make yourself by your choices. It's like a stakeless repentance motif. Yeah, yeah. And 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 so we we are being taught by the media 
that there are no absolutes, that justice is relative, and that to say, well, yeah, he did some really good things, but being now truly repentant, nonetheless, he will turn himself over to ju to justice now, right? Well, well, no, because they would like to execute him. Yes, they would. <laughs> that is what justice demands. <laughs> uh, Paul stands before the Roman governor and says, if I have done things worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Mm -hmm. It's it, the, the Christian motif uh, system worldview says that if you've committed crimes and you're sorry, you repent and God has changed your heart, you turn yourself in and you submit to justice and you testify against yourself. You, you, I'm sorry, I just went blank. What's the word when you say I did it? Confess. confess. <laughs> yeah, you confess to yeah. the crime. I mean, it's and, Philemon and, and Onesimus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Onesimus is, uh, his heart has changed and he doesn't say, well, I'm free. I don't need to go back to my master. Paul says, yeah, you kind of do actually. Now, how he treats you on the other end, that's up to him. But you, you are bound by God's law order in the meantime. And so we've become very good at liking stories where the bad guy, by his choices, regenerates himself and puts himself beyond the demands of justice. And yet we still, and, and then he can become a vigilante going out after other bad guys who aren't sorry yet. <laughs> we, we've got a really screwed up concept of justice that we need to start working on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is some kind of contribution to thinking through these things. There will be yeah. an episode on tangential, highly, <laughs> highly will. related topics. There will be. And, 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 and we're, yeah, we're getting to the Ten Commandments, and I assume that they will all have some tangential <laughs> things here and there that yep. will lengthen this podcast as long <laughs> as it needs to be lengthened. Yeah. Um, one thing that jumped out at me about the imprecatory psalms lately was that there's a place for this anger but you notice what it is is it's a psalm mm -hmm. you're, you're taking that anger and you're communicating it to god not right. to anybody else not just <laughs> going off you know not to your troops as they're arming themselves right it's <laughs> the, but i love that god included these psalms to say you crave justice and that yes. is healthy and good and righteous and don't mm. don't softball that that's yeah. real and it's good mm -hmm. no, without justice the cross is meaningless in fact it's yeah. a really bad joke mm -hmm. very horrible joke for the father who sacrificed his son uh, yeah. so these are these are things we in this podcast we will keep coming back to mm -hmm. one god god is one and we don't get to pick and choose what parts of God we like because he has none. He is himself. Now, taking this back to the beginning and our uh, our quibbles about national anthem, obviously <laughs> Israel stands apart. I don't know of any nation, I, I may be lack, missing something here, but I don't know of any modern nation that has a worship song as its national anthem. Nor does any nation have the kind of covenant that Israel had with God, all nations ought to serve Jesus Christ. Psalm 2 makes that very clear. But they don't have the same kind of promises. They'll endure forever, that God will always protect them and bless them, that they will always walk in God's grace, you know, things of this sort. And it, it, But just as marriage on a finite created level images God's covenant, so commonwealths image God's covenant. Marriage has its songs which should be holy and pure and yet joyful and rejoicing in the wonders of bride and bridegroom. We, Song of Solomon is a prototype, but it goes way beyond that. Uh, I, I, I think we can argue from this carefully that it is all right for nations to sing songs about themselves. They just have to be really careful what they say <laughs> about themselves. Yeah. And any claim of, and God's going to bless us because we're just the coolest people ever, uh, are right out. <laughs> On mean, what it, basis <laughs> claim you these things? It, it, it is one thing to, to claim that God has blessed us historically and to point out particular marks of his favor in the past. It is another thing to claim we are the anointed elect nation whom God will always back up no matter what, and so we're always going to win because we're always that cool. And was Jerusalem builded here among those dark satanic mills? 
Oh, ooh, ooh. Okay, anybody who uh, can spot that quote and identify it in an email <laughs> will get something special from us. I'm not sure what, but I think we have special things we can give away. Um, you realize Google is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no, you had to have recognized the quote when Brian said it. You don't get to Google it. <sighs> Honor system is fine. Okay. <laughs> Honor system, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we were we were talking before uh, the broadcast about some of the national anthems we've encountered. Uh, my one of my favorites is "God Save the Queen," mm -hmm. and there is uh, one stanza that I might be able to quote from memory, but I won't. It goes like, "It's an appeal to God on behalf of the Queen: O Lord, our God, arise, scatter her enemies, and make them fall, confound their politics." Frustrate their knavish tricks. On thee our hopes we fix. God save us all. Now, that's not bad if you are repentant and trusting God in Christ. If you think just because God's blessed us for an awful long time and we've done cool stuff, and then turn to God with these words, that's arrogant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so context is a lot of it. Our own national anthem of course, it was written during the War of 1812 by Francis Scott Key as he watched the bombardment of, of uh, Fort McHenry in um, Baltimore Harbor. And it's mostly, and then the first verse is technically the only part that's a national anthem. It's mostly just watching the bombs and rockets fall on this big mound of mud that was Fort McHenry with this huge flag with 15 stripes because they were adding one stripe per new state in those days. And it would be illumined every time the bombs went off. And the question is, will it stand through the night? Because if it stands, the British are probably, probably going to give up and, and go a different direction because this fort guards the, the entrance to the harbor. If it falls, if the flag falls, if it's drawn down, then this part of the country is opened up. And of course, the constant question is, does it still wave? By dawn's mm -hmm. early light, do we still see the flag? And some people have criticized the uh, even this one stanza for its blatant militarism. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're sitting here getting bombed, thank you. We're really not fighting anybody. We're just seeing if we can make it through the night and keep the flag up. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is one one line, um, or one stanza, it goes like this. Speaking of the invaders, their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner and Triumph with Wave are the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's, it's, it's a little um, harsh there, but it does note that a lot of these people are hirelings. It does say some of them are <laughs> slaves. But that's nothing compared to the uh, Marseillaise, the French national anthem, of which I have just a little bit. To arm, citizen, form your battalions. Let's march, let's march. Let impure blood water our furrows. And it goes from there. Yes. Um, <laughs> now it does. It does. It talks about the the horrible tyrants and despots who are plotting to take away their freedom. It does contain a stanza where they say, and, and it's and it's not necessarily about all the soldiers because many of them themselves are dupes and puppets of the big bad guys at the end of the module. So uh, we can show it's it, it's commendable that we show mercy to the dupes, but the big bad guys they got to go. Uh, and, and, and and so throughout, we can look at all the national anthems of the world. And the problem is not that they're national anthems. And the problem isn't, the, isn't that they talk about war, because sometimes wars are necessary to defend your very existence and the freedoms God has given you. But when they presume to think that God will bless them, that God's on their side, just because they're Americans, British, Scots, Germans, Spanish, that's not the gospel. God blesses nations through his son. And when we turn away from the son, if we do not kiss the son, he will be angry and we will perish from the way. So national anthems have their place, but the best ones would be the one that continually beseech God for his mercy into the next generation while giving him thanks for what he's done for us in the past. Uh, the blessings of repentance and grace and salvation. And I think the fourth verse of the Star Spangled Banner does just that. Would you like to read that? Do you have it up? or I don't have it up. Do okay. you? I do have it up. I Good. can read it. All right. Verse four. 
Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I had forgotten and those are wonderful words. Win mm -hmm. our cause when it is just. Mm -hmm. And our motto must be in God is our trust. On those conditions, we can ask for God's blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we fail of those, we get cocky and we get in trouble with God. Not a place to be when you're at war. Yeah. And of course, there's always the caveat that just because you win in battle doesn't prove that your cause was just. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, that's a, that's a little bit of uh, a poetic justice in, in what uh, Francis Scott Key wrote. One other quibble that I could make but won't is uh, the power, which of course is capitalized. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it'd be easy to say, oh, no, not another deist. Well, actually, no, he wasn't mm -hmm. because he wrote a hymn. Lord, with glowing heart, we praise thee for the bliss that I love bestows, for the pardoning grace that saves me and the peace from which from it flows. Help, O oh Lord, my weak endeavor, this dull soul to rapture raise. Thou must light the flame or never can my heart be warmed to praise. Mm. And it goes on to talk about the light of hope revealing uh, the blood-stained cross. Uh, Francis Scott Key was an evangelical Christian. And like so many of the time, he borrowed the language that was popular in the culture, speaking of God as, as the transcendentalist and of the power. <laughs> but we, we must not misread him there. He's he's yeah. talking about the triumph of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. So there's are, are there better songs that we could have picked as a national anthem? Well, you can think of, of uh, America the Beautiful. No. But... <laughs> Please, no. Oh, that's what about right. This you land is my up? land. <laughs> I would prefer This Land is My Land to America the Beautiful, <laughs> frankly. Um, first of all, let, let's deal with both of those, because interestingly enough, those have both come up lately for me. Uh, America the Beautiful. Yeah, I remember mentioning the the, the Alabaster City thing. Yeah. But God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood. Now, you didn't like the sea from Shining Sea part, as I recall. I, I, I got stuck back with crown thy good. That would involve us having any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's not right. God, look at how good we are. Okay, we lost that one right there. Let's yep. stop singing. It, it it goes downhill. It's uh, a bad song. <laughs> I will die on this hill. <laughs> um, and then, Brian, this land is your land. You know, when I grew up as a kid, I assumed that that was an ancient folk song. <laughs> because by the time I was in fifth grade... I knew it. Everybody knew it. I didn't know that it had come out like a couple of years earlier. <laughs> well, who was it? Was it Arthur Guthrie? Uh, Woody Guthrie, I believe. Woody Guthrie, who, yeah. who who wrote it. And this from my girls, who are now fans of uh, Bakersfield country music. Apparently, it was from the Oak. It was written out of the Oki tradition, who, when they moved to California, hmm. were frowned upon. <laughs> Because uh, you're you're intruders in our territory, and they're saying, "Man, no, this land is your land, and it's my land. All of it. I can go wherever I want and live wherever I want." So it's an so, anti-Dutch immigrant, or the yeah, yeah. It's yeah. The, so yeah. yeah, so there you go. Uh, we could do um, the other America, um, the one that said to the tune of "God Save the Queen." Oh, How's it go? Yeah, um, there's a whole apocryphal story about this in the revolutionary war i can't remember the name of it though my country tis yeah me. that one sorry i completely blank. <laughs> sweet land of liberty of the icing okay mm -hmm. i'm singing about this land and it's folder there it's not too bad land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside let freedom ring it's fairly innocuous i think it gets better toward the end but um i got no problem with the star spangled banner it's Yes, it takes an operatic voice to do it well, but we have enough of those. We can find enough to <laughs> fill in at ball games and things. Do and we? At high though? school graduations. <laughs> there, there are some people who have tried. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The best one I remember uh, was Renee Fleming, who is an actual operatic soprano, and she mm. came out and did it, and it was just. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And our school still does it at graduation every year. And I do not apologize. 
Well, I'm guessing that it's about time to do recommendations. It is. And David has informed me that I am going first this week because I don't go first with recommendations. <laughs> so thus saith the producer. My recommendation is going to be the album by Andrew Peterson entitled Behold the Lamb of God. It is a Christmas album that is a recording of his annual Christmas concert. And it spends like most of the show in the Old Testament. And Ooh. it's wonderful. Do recommend listening through in order. Just don't don't just put it on shuffle. There's an arc to it. Um, is that like putting Messiah on shuffle? Oh, oh man. No. <laughs> I see, I used to think I did not like Handel's Messiah. And then I was in choir and we finally sang it all the way through from beginning to end. I was like, mm. oh, it makes sense now. This isn't just <laughs> awful. This is magnificent. So order does make all the difference. We've been talking about how important chronology is, right? Yeah. 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 Follow yeah. the story in order and it's great. Same with Handel's Messiah. Same with Andrew Peterson's Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, he's kind of a folk style singer. So if that's not your cup of tea, mm, give it a chance. You might, you might like it. I love I Andrew really Peterson. It. Yeah, he's super great. And that album is really good, too. Yeah, so. it's just been nominated, actually, for a Dove Award. Remember Dove Awards? I think Dove I Awards? just saw it won. Unless that, Did it? I don't know. I don't know when the Dove Awards are. So Yeah, me either. <laughs> I didn't know there were Dove Awards anymore. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. So obviously not our strong point. <laughs> Brian, what do you got for us this week? Um... I I'm choosing from three and I'm kind of trying to decide which one to recommend because they're all Flip very a coin, good. A three-sided coin. A three-sided. <laughs> hear yourself. Um, I will. I no, will. Go all coins have three sides. That's right. In any case. Um, <laughs> oh, it landed on its edge. Perfect. Uh, uh, so uh, this week I'm going to recommend broadly. The the theologian Vern Poitras, mm. but oh. then specifically uh, the book that, by him that I'm reading called Redeeming Mathematics. Yay. Oh, I have that. Which I have is been meaning to read that for ages. <laughs> phenomenal. I'm about halfway through now, and there there was one chapter where I was just having a lot of trouble tracking his argument because I am not as good at math as I used to be. Mm. But there's really really good stuff uh, in there talking about how mathematics is an outflowing from the, the self-consistency and nature of God himself. Mm -hmm. And specifically how you can, a theologian can actually draw out mathematical principles mm -hmm. from recognizing there's one God. Cool. We start Correct. with one. Yes. And then we have the principle of addition because the father begets the son eternally. And right. now you have two. And then you know, from there you can add infinitely, because, but you but you've set the pattern with one plus one equals two. Well, if we add one, then you get three, and then so on and so forth. And what was the chapter I just read yesterday? It was about multiplication and how there's proportions and area and cubic area, cubic area, whatever <laughs> volume, volume. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, in the the measurements for the tabernacle itself as well, right. and so like God, God is is concerned with math it's something that he's made it it's something that is a, a function and 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 part of the universe he's created and it's been really really cool to read through this and he the first chapter i think he he specifically says like you may have read this first paragraph i wrote as you know a non-believer and you may be wondering oh great he's going to be talking <laughs> about god every chapter he's like well yes i am because i'm a christian and <laughs> the world is made by god and so and math is a part of that world so just try and put up with the things you don't like hearing about for a bit to get to the subject of what i'm talking about specifically <laughs> and then yeah. he does he talks about god pretty much every chapter and it's been really good so that's my recommendation Vern poitras redeeming mathematics can I tell a fun story about Rin Poitras and Please do. mathematics? I have not read this book, but I've read, uh, I think, a short essay on the topic. And I don't know, I'm not a math major. I wasn't one in college. I just, it's not my thing. I like math, but I didn't pursue the theory of mathematics or the philosophy of it 
very far at all. So, so this one essay that I read, like, kind of informed a lot of the thoughts that I do have about the philosophy of math. And one of my friends was, was like, Emily, you might be like, one of the strangest friends I have. Like, <laughs> I have some strange friends, but you're up there. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You know, I, I don't understand. Like, thanks, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, but why? And, and they're like, you see, people ask you a question like, what is number theory? And you're like, the Trinity. And then you go on from there. I'm like, I guess that's fair. That is, that is a fact. So that's my fun story. Nice. <laughs> um, my recommendation is is guarded because I haven't read the whole book yet. I've just read um, something in the middle. But I was um, where? Oh, this is there's a story behind this. My wife left a children's book lying around about the uh, voyages of discovery, and in passing, this little book is aimed at, at probably junior high or maybe a little younger, made some remark about how Christians had destroyed the, the library in Alexandria uh, in 391 Ooh, AD. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I said. And I said, that doesn't sound like anything that I even remember, good or bad or distorted or not. And so I, I went online and an article came up by uh, a man named uh, David Bentley Hart, where he went into where the apparently it's a story that's been floating around for a long time it has its roots in uh, gibbon's decline and fall and it's a complete lie it's completely made up out of a passing reference that gibbon makes that, that, that isn't even anchored in what was really going on and it's one of these this is one of the situations where we actually do have accounts on both sides of what happened both from the pagan and the christian and they're consistent with each other and basically mm -hmm. First of all, the library at Alexandria was gone, gone <laughs> by 391. Uh, two, we're talking about a particular pagan temple that had been revived that may or may not have had a library at that point. And what happened was something like we're seeing in the streets today where uh, Christian, the, uh, the emperor had closed down the temple and Christians were getting a little haughty and, and, and flaunting the temple treasures that were going to be destroyed and a pagan mob rose up and attacked them and the Christians retaliated using the word Christian here very loosely. And when all was said and done, there was no library destroyed. There may or may not have been some books burned inadvertently, but this was not an attack on, on learning or, or a display of Christians hostility toward classical education or thinking or rationality or anything like that else. But wow. That's an interesting, I, I like this writer. Who is he? And so I clicked on um, Amazon for his books and I came up with Atheist Delusions, The Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable Enemies. And so I jumped into the book at the point where he tells that same story. There's, there, he develops it more, but his writing style is wonderful. Nice vocabulary that doesn't send you back to the dictionary. <laughs> every line, but every now and then you have to stop and say, wait, what does that word mean? Uh, but usually it just flows. He's a good storyteller. He is, according to um, Google, he's a um, high Anglican who's converted to Greek Ortho or Eastern Orthodoxy. But as you read this, what he's talking about, he's defending Christendom, the Christian tradition of rationality for all of us. And mm -hmm. from what I did read, uh, you know, I, I can stand a little Eastern Orthodoxy here and there if he's going to take a stance with a kind of diverse knowledge and expertise he has in original sources and can just say, you know, yeah, that's dumb. Here's what really <laughs> happened. I mean, he's not, he's, not a, he's not above saying, yeah, you're making that up. Let me now tell you what really happened and here are the primary sources involved mm -hmm. and yet keep it interesting, keep it flowing. Mm -hmm. So again, David Bentley Hart, Atheist Delusions, The Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable Enemies. His targets are the so-called new atheists, some of whom are dying. And so, you know, I knew that makes it. But he's saying, you guys have been attacking Christianity and saying how horrible it is. Let's talk about what history actually says about Christianity. Mm -hmm. And he is decidedly on the side of the angels. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot speak to any specific points where he may um, say things that we wouldn't agree with from our stance. But I, I think that anyone who reads this is going to profit and enjoy. There's mine. Neat.
I will just also uh, issue a general notice. I guess, not, I guess a warning. <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, David Bentley Hart is also, at least as of the past couple of years, a universalist. Oh, uh, that's he unfortunate. He has written in defense of that. Yeah, I saw some titles that I thought looked like he might be leading that way, but this book seems not there. So that's good. I will recommend this book without record. And we do that a lot. We can recommend yeah, we do. one book or song or something without recommending everything the there person wrote. There is only one perfect book. And there's only yes. one perfect author. And all of yeah. his books, which make up one book, <laughs> um, are all interdependent and alike infallible and inerrant in the original text. So, so we yeah. all recommend the Holy Bible. Yes. Yes, right. that is our group recommendation. Group yes, recommendation. and if you have not been reading your Holy Bible lately in this time of darkness and confusion, maybe God's knocking at your door saying, come back to the Bible, mm -hmm. back to the Word of God. Yeah, great. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been a blast. It has, especially since I had no idea where this was going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always an adventure. Like, we have yeah. our outline and then, you know, conversation happens. So... Thank you also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you. Thank you to our listeners. Whether or not you support us financially, we appreciate you listening. Let us know what you think. Um, we got some lovely supportive feedback when we were out in California. It was super encouraging to hear. So send us an email, whether or not you like what we're saying. Please <laughs> send us an email. Haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, there's something else I'm supposed to tell you about, but I don't remember what it is. So I'll try and remember it for next week. <laughs> Until then, take care. Be well. Read your Bible. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>